Every now and then, I like to challenge myself to make a basic game in about an hour. And today I'm going to be making this sliding puzzle game. And I know I can make this game in an hour. The challenge is going to be, can I make the game and explain everything I'm doing within an hour? And the time right now just changed to 11.15 a.m. So I'm going to get started. And I am going to be using a few things to help me out. And one of them is the phaser snippets that I've put together on phasergames.com. And I'm also going to be using the phaser templates that you can find as a free download. And I'll just be using the basic phaser template today. And this is a template that I have made just to save time so I can get started right away on projects. Because I don't want to have to set up the basic JavaScript every time over and over. It just gets repetitive. So I make a copy of that folder. I'll rename it to sliding puzzle. And then I'll copy this path and open it in my editor. And I'm using Sublime, but you go ahead and use whatever editor that you feel comfortable with to do this project. And I am using images that I have already prepared. And if you feel like that's cheating uh, about the time, I often don't handle the images myself. Uh, at my work, I am given images by the artist. But these are just some I got from public domain sites that I resized and have used for other games. And it's really the coding challenge that I'm after. I'm not after any kind of image challenge. I'm not an artist by any means. So what I care about is the code. And I'm going to copy that into here. And these are numbered from 1 to 100. So let me go ahead and open up the main file. And I'm going to go ahead and point the browser to our new sliding puzzle folder. And as you can see, it's just a blank canvas in portrait mode. Now I want to change that to landscape. And if you look here on line 8, this is where it sets up for desktop. The other is set up for mobile down here, and it goes based on the device's width at height. So you don't need to change that. You can just leave that alone. And I'm going to turn it here to 640 to 480. Just flip those numbers. And if you make a change and you refresh and you don't see it, at least on Windows, you can push Control F5 and the cache will be cleared because it does cache the code at times. So it set up this blank canvas. I've got the word ready over here in the console, which is under state main. And I'll just go ahead and take that out. And this is where we're going to be building all of our code. The first thing we need to do is to preload the images. And if you go over to the phaser snippets, and it's under the sprite snippets. This is the bit of code we'll be using here to insert an image into the library. Game, load, image, library key, and then the path to the image. Now we have 100 images. And as I said, they go from 1 to 100. So we say, do this loop while i is less than 101. And we advance it 1. Let's put this back up here. And the library key, we'll just use the word pick plus the number. So pick 1, pick 2, etc. And the path to image is going to be images slash and plus the i and then jpeg so 
I'm going to run that to see if we have any errors over here. And they'll appear over here in the console if we do. Good. Nothing. Now let's put a test image on the stage and what we can do is we can pick a random one. If we go to Phaser Snippets Miscellaneous, down towards the, here it is, the middle random number. So pick index equals, well that's the variable we'll put it on, equals game.ran.integer in range and the minimum is 1 and the top picture is numbered 100. So the key would be as before pick plus pick index. We'll go back to the snippets over here and add an image to the stage. And we'll just put it at x of 0 and a y at 0 and the variable key. There. We have a random image every time. Now we're loading this as an image up here in the path to it. We're loading this as an image up here in game load image but we want to be able to put the image into squares. And I'm just going to go ahead and comment out this code right here that we're putting a picture there. What we want to do is tell Phaser that this is a sprite sheet. I know it's not a sprite sheet, but if we divide it up into squares, it's easier than actually going through and uh, having everything in individual squares like an artist would cut them up or something and then we that would be a lot of extra work so let's set turns this to sprite sheet and you'll see what I'm doing in just a moment and we want them to be I think 80 by 80 sized squares I think that's right because each image is 480 by 40. If I just pull open the calculator here. So 480 divided by 80 will be 6 rows and 400 divided by 80 would be 5 rows or columns. Let's see, so it's, it's wider. So it will be 6 columns by 5 rows. We'll go ahead and reuse some of this code here. Pick index and the key, but we won't. Actually, let's go ahead and see what it looks like on stage. We should only get a single square of the picture now, which will be the first square. Yes. Okay, so I'll take out that line now. So then we need to build a grid. And a grid is pretty easy to do by looping through the size we need. And as we said before, we're going to have six columns. And we're going to have five rows. Let me change that to a little bit better programming. Var row equals zero row is less than 5. And I'll just move this for next loop inside this for next loop. And change that I to column. Now we're going to make a new sprite and if you remember before, under our snippets, add an image to stage. And we'll just call it block. Take out that extra bit of code there. So 
block equals game add sprite and we need the X and the Y and the library key. And the key we have already made up here on line 14. And the X and the Y is going to be the column times 80 and the row times 80. So that should give us a grid of blocks. Each block is 80 pixels wide and 80 pixels high, and we're spacing them based on the height and the width. Now, right now we have a fixed height and width, so I'm using 80. A lot of times I would do a different line saying block x equals column times block width. And you have to do that on the next line because the block has to be made ahead of time before you can have the width of the height. But I can just leave it like that for right now. And let's see what our game looks like now. There. We've got a grid, but they're all the same picture. They're all frame one of that block. So what we can do here just to count We'll put a variable count equals zero. And we can say block frame equals count. And the frames do start at zero. So we don't want to advance that till after we assign the count to the frame. And then count plus plus. There. Now we've got our image there again. The difference is that these are blocks. These are individual pictures now making up one. And we know that because of the code we did. But let's just put in if everything was spaced by 81 pixels apart. Now you can see the lines. And if we want lines on the puzzle, then we can put them a bit apart. We'll go ahead and put them 82 apart, and we'll keep those lines in there. I kind of like that. Nice. So we want to center this, and we can simply add some numbers in here to the columns and the rows to be able to get that there. But um, it's easier to make a group. So we'll make a group called block group. And I'm putting it as this block group so the other parts of the state can have access to it. And it's game add group. That's all there is to it. And here I say this block group add block. Now, so far, you won't see any changes in the program at all. But those are inside of the group. And the way I know this is now I can move the group, saying this block group x equals 100, for example. There, and it's moved over. But I want to center it. And the way you can center a group is to say this block group x equals game width divided by 2. Now this will start the block at the center of the screen here. If I refresh, you'll see it goes straight at the center. But we want to center this inside the game. So we can subtract half of the block group's width. And that should center it on the screen. There we go. And the nice thing about that is that it will center that even if we change the screen size. Say that we went on an iPad, for example, and put it in landscape mode. It still centers it. Now, it's not to scale, and we will work on that later. But you can see it does center it every time. And if we want to center it vertically as well, we can say this block group y equals game height divided by 2 minus 
this block group height divided by two. Great, and now we can work on scaling later. But as you can see, no matter how big we make the grid or if we change the canvas size, this is always going to be in the center. I'm going to put this back on desktop mode. There. Now the next thing we need to do is to be able to move the pieces. And to move the piece, we are going to have to have um, a blank piece as well. And for right now, we and that's going to be the last piece. So we can say this in block. And the in block is going to be the last block that is created. But we're just making a reference to that. And we know which one it is do is we want that to be a black square. So I think the easiest thing for me to do is to make a black square that is 80 by 80. So I usually prepare the art ahead of time, but I'm coding on the fly here. And if you'd like to, when you make something like this, you can also, it's a nice little touch if you're making it for the client. You can put their logo or their business name on that block. Crazygames.com. It's a little bit small, but there we go. block.png. I'll preload that up here. Game load image and call it block or call it blank. We're using block a lot of other places here. Blank images I think I called it block though on the file name block png. And the end block, which is just a sprite, we can change the sprite by saying this in block load texture blank. Not 100% sure that will work because I haven't used load texture much. So let's go over and see. It did, and we need to take the angle off of it now. So every time we move a block, we're going to change places with that phasergames.com block right there. So we can make each block clickable by saying block input enabled equals true. And giving it an event block. And you've got it right here, too. I can type it out, but if you'd like to just copy it, it's under, I think, button snippets. There's input enabled that we just did. And events. Change that to your sprite name, block. Events on input up. And I'm going to use on input down. And one reason I do that is the browser is just a little bit funny about on input up. And the click handler pick block. And the scope 
always just put this. Because if you don't put a scope, then um, the word keyword this will mean something else inside your click event function. And pick block event function. And it always passes the target on an event. So whatever you click will be passed to this pick block function. So say target angle equals 45. So now whenever I click something, it can tell where it is. And we don't want that last block to be we don't want that last block to be clicked. Let me change the word target to block. And if this in block equals block, and then we just return out of here. Let's check that. So that's not doing it, but that is. Okay. So good. We're ignoring that last block now. So what we want to do is swap places. When I click a block, I want it to switch places with this end block. And we also have to make sure that it's right next to each other. But first, we're just going to do the changing. So we could simply say that block x equals this block group. Oops. We could simply say we could simply say block x equals this in block x and block y equals this in block y. But then we wouldn't be able to see it move. It would happen very quickly and the user wouldn't know what was going on. And it's also behind there. We'd also need to be able to take the end block and put it at the blo the clicked block and then we'd have to send and then we'd have to save the values first because after this we change the value of block x so let's say that x1 equals the clicked blocks x and y1 equals block y1 And then we say this in block equals y1, and this in block equals x equals x1. And then they would change places. And that sort of works. Kind of happy with that, but we're doing okay on time here in our hour challenge. So let's make it a little bit more uh, with a flourish and by using some tweens. Let me go to the tween snippets here, and there's only two snippets in here an example of a tween and a tween complete. I'll just make a function called move block. And we pass in a parameter of block, an x and a y. And I'm using xx and yy to distinguish it from the normal x and y. So game add sprite to, and then we have a time, an easing which I just always use none. There's different easings, and it will be about like bounce and elastic and, and nice things. I usually just use none to do a, a smooth transition. 
and the true is whether or not we want the tween to start right away because you can set up tweens. And let's see, that's the block. And the y needs to go to yy. And the x to xx. So now what I can say is this move block block and this in block x and this in block y which is the what I've done up here automatically or quickly changing to that so I can take that out now let's check that out mistake there. Ah, I forgot to put a comma after the move block function. Still seems to just be swapping places. There we are. We can see that now moving to the end block. Let's also do the same with the in block. And we need to move to these variables here that we saved. Because otherwise, they're going to be both going at once. And it's going to go to um, sort of slightly off, where, wherever it catches it in mid-flight. So it's good. we need to save that here, because we're already changing the values down here. There we go. And now they're swapping places. Now, one of the problems is if I click very fast, then everything's going to get jumbled. So what we need to do is put in a click lock. And that's just a variable that we make up here at the top, the create statement. This click lock equals false. And then when we pick a block, we check to see if this click lock equals true, then we return out of here. And then if we've gotten through all these if thens, then we set this click lock equals true. So now I'll only be able to click on once and it won't go again. I can click all I want, it's not moving. So we need to be able to reset that. And we're going to do that on the end of the tween. So var tw equals, short for tween, equals game add tween block. Now we're actually doing two tweens. But since they're the same length of time, we'll go on, uh, since they're the same length of time, it should be OK. soon as they stop flying, then this click lock equals false. So see, when it's moving, I can't click anywhere. As soon as it stops moving, I can. The other thing you might notice is that the blocks are going behind each other. So I want to move those to the top. Block move to top. And this in block move to top. Ah, my apologies, bring to top.
There we are. But I think that we would want the one that we're moving more than the square to be on top. So I'll just take out that ring to top there. There, now our colorful image is always on top. Now we need to be able to check if the everything is going to be in the right place. So I'm going to set that up now. And when we create the block, it is in the right place already. So we're going to say block OX equals X and block OY equals Y. And what this is doing, it's storing the initial X and Y position inside that sprite. So we'll be able to loop through that later and check. So it's not very fun that we can just click anywhere and that they'll move because it needs to be right next to it. So what we can do is we can get the difference between the end block and the block that's clicked. So the difference in the x equals math absolute value because even if it is 100 pixels away to the right or negative 100 pixels to the left, we want that to still equal 100. And all the math ABS does is takes off the minus sign of a number. So the in block x minus block x. And the y, the same thing, math absolute value, the in block y minus block y. And if the difference of x is greater than 82, which is what we're placing them by, or the difference of y is greater than 82, then we simply return. Let's test that out. And I have an error here, state main. Ah, block OX equals block X. So when we're saving those initial values there, block OX and block OA equals block X and block Y. There we are. Now, I can't click on any of these, but I should be able to click there, yes. Ah. But as you can see, I, these, this is still, so I can, I can click on these as I'm supposed to be able to, but I can also click diagonally because that is um, exactly 82 away as well. So we can say, um, let's see. So we need to rule out that block. So I think we can say if the diff x, y is equal to 82 and the difference 82, then we can return. So just for that one block. Because this, uh, otherwise the diff x or the diff y will be 0 and 1 will be 82. But if they're both 82, so that still works but not the diagonal ones now. Great. Now we can move on to, it's not much of a puzzle unless we scramble those up. So how are we doing on time? 11.54. So great, we've been, uh, been doing it for about 40 minutes now. So I've got about 20 minutes left. So scramble the pictures. Scramble picks function. And we need our good friend the random here as well. Um, random numbers. So I'm just going to copy it from right up here. And I'm going to make a variable var block one. 
and what I'm going to do is say 0 to this block group link. Right and block two and the same thing. So we're picking two blocks at random. And we'll make a little function down here called swap blocks. Block one, block two, and we need to make temporary variables temp x equals block 1 x bar temp y equals block 1 y. And of course the reason we're making temporary variables is because we're changing block 1's variables and then it would be the same if we said block 1 x equals block 2 x and then we said block 2 x equals block 1 x then it would simply be going to the same place because we've already assigned it uh, the x. The value of block 2 has gone into block 1. So that's why we need the temporary or it just it wouldn't change. And see here block 1 y equals block 2 y. swap blocks block one block two and then we call this swap blocks up here at the end of our create statement and another error unexpected identifier which is simply my forgetting to put the commas between the function So did it swap any of the blocks? I don't know because we're only doing it once at the moment. Can it read property X of undefined? Ah, because what I did here was got a number rather than a child. So block one equals this group, block group, get child at and that would be block one and I'm going to change that to block one index so something is still not working right ah because I called swap blocks instead of scrambled picks there we are this swap blocks good now this and this is one picture that's out of place here. So now all I need to do is call that like 100 times. So var equals 0. i is less than 100. We've got about 15 minutes left. And what has happened now is it's tried to pull up child 30 because the length of that is starts counting at 1. So uh, 0 through 29 would be how many children are in there because there are 30 children. So block group length minus 1. There we go. Now it's all scrambled up. So it's playable but we don't know if there is a win condition yet. So we need to check win after every time that the, uh, the blocks are moved. So when the tween is done, then we can call a function called this check win. We just loop through that group by saying this block group for each And then we put an anonymous function, which is just a function without a name inside of here. And function block. 
and we're going to bind it to the scope of the state called bind this. And if the block x doesn't equal block original x or block y doesn't equal block original y, then we know something's not in place. And we just make a variable here called when equals true. And then we set when equals false if it triggers any of these. And then we can console log out when after every one. And we can also see how many are out of place set by making a right count or rather wrong count would be better wrong count equals zero and every time one is out of place then wrong count plus plus and right now just console log wrong count equals And again, I think I forgot to put the comma. That's all working, but that's rather slow. I'm not going to make uh, the next in the next 10 minutes if the tween is that slow. So let's speed that up by 10 times. Now, just for testing purposes, I'm only going to scramble two blocks. That way we can check the win condition. So, uh, but of course, <laughs> that doesn't really help too much in this game. So, um, what I can also do is take off the limitations about where the game, where the, uh, the blocks are right now so I can move them from anywhere so it's still very difficult but I can see that it's working here by getting the wrong count the count is three and the count is zero. Wrong count equals zero, and the win condition equals true. Now I'll put all the, uh, the scrambling back on. And the checks. So there is the basic logic for the puzzle game. Now you can put in more about sound effects and a score and a timer and everything. Uh, and then just go to your win screen or the win condition when this win variable here equals true. That is the basics of how you put together a sliding puzzle game. And I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, please check out the rest of my stuff at phasergames.com. Thanks very much.